Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards, bring you Linda Darnell in Kathleen Norris's great novel, Mother, on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a story which has not only proved extremely popular since its first publication, but is particularly appropriate to the anniversary we celebrate this coming Sunday. Kathleen Norris's novel, Mother, as its title informs us about as simply as a title can, is a warm-hearted glorification of that human relationship which is so close to us all the year round, but which, on the second Sunday in May each year, we bring, as it were, into special focus. There are few writers who do this sort of thing better than Kathleen Norris, who wrote many, many popular novels, of which the one we've chosen for tonight seems to have been the bestseller of them all. We are additionally lucky tonight to have as our star that delightful Hollywood actress, Linda Darnell. And now, Frank Goss, haven't you a word about Hallmark? There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy, there is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, starring Linda Darnell in Kathleen Norris's novel, Mother. The house was old, and the stairs groaned and wheezed with the complaints of the old. The furniture was cheap, grown shabby with the years, and the smell of cooking clung to it. The seven Paget children and their father and mother lived in the house. Margaret was the oldest. She hated the house, had hated it for quite a long time. until the children leave for school. Then you and I will give the baby a bath. Rain. That means the classroom will be full of wet clothes and the stove won't work and the schoolyard will be full of mud. Oh, Margaret. That doesn't sound like you. Oh, Mother, don't you ever get sick of the drudgery of, of cheap clothes and cheap dishes and cheap furniture? Don't you ever get sick of poverty? Margaret, I've never felt poor. How could I sit at our dinner table and feel poor with your father sitting there and seven young faces smiling back at me? You haven't felt poor. Mother, other women have time to take care of their hands and their hair and to fix up and have people into tea and, and to go to beauty parlors. Well, those aren't the women with seven children, are they, Margaret? No, you bet. Those aren't the women with seven children. I'd rather have my children. Margaret, you're going to be late. Mother, is my hair ribbon straight? Hmm? Turn around. Oh, no, here, let me fix it, dear. It's a little crooked, Julie. Oh, good heavens, there's a school bell. I've got to run. Bye, Mother. Wrap up good, dear. <laughs> You're going home to lunch in this rain. No, I don't think so, Emily. I thought I'd just fix some tea here in the teacher's room. I think I'll join you. My class certainly acted up today. I guess it's the weather. 
They're sure making a racket this noon, aren't they? Dorothy, Dorothy, don't cry like that. Now, look, put your arms around my neck. That's a good girl. Now, let me pick you up. Let me pick you up. Now, Dorothy, don't you cry. Dorothy, you're not hurt. We must get a doctor. Was she run over? No, she just fell against the car. Oh, well, my mother always says that no child that can cry is badly hurt, but we'll have the doctor come over to be sure. Uh, children, children, I want you all to go back to your classrooms. Dorothy's had a bad scare, but she's going to be all right. And I want you to see how quiet you can be. Emily, may my class go in with yours for a while? Of course, Margaret. Children, children, form lines now. Yes, ma'am. Form lines. Oh, it hurts. I know, Dorothy, but you're all right now. Oh, Ted, you run down the street and ask Dr. Potts to come over, will you? Yes, Margaret. And uh, we'll go inside and wait for the doctor. May I come with you? Of course. I'm heavy. My name is Padger. Yes, you are, Dorothy. Uh, we'll go right in the principal's office. She isn't here today. Uh, this is the door. Would you mind opening it? No, of course not. Uh, now, Dorothy. Now, dear, we'll, we'll just put you here in this big chair. I was hurt. Uh, yes, we know, Dorothy. Oh, if you'll sit down, Mrs. Mrs. Carbold. Mrs. Carbold? You say that as though you know the name. Well, I imagine that everyone who reads the society section of a newspaper must know your name. Well, I was driving through Weston to visit some friends upstate. What is your name, my dear? Margaret Paget. Well, Margaret, you managed this whole situation very capably just now. You got the children back in their rooms and you averted what might have been a very hysterical situation. Do you like teaching, Miss Paget? No. Not really. You don't? Well, why don't you come to New York and do something else? Well, I'm afraid that's easier said than done. I don't know anyone in New York. Well, I'm sure you're far too clever and good-looking to waste your life down here. I'll tell you, Miss Paget, my personal secretary is leaving me to get married. If you'd care for the position, we might be able to come to an agreement. If I'd care for it? I have two small daughters. You could help them with their studies when they're home from school. Other than that, it would be secretarial work. I'd expect you to travel with me wherever I went, of course. Oh, it sounds like a dream. Oh, uh, come in. Hello, Margaret. Oh, come in, Dr. Potts. Oh, Mrs. Carbold, may I present our doctor, Dr. Potts? How do you do, Doctor? How do? Well, Dorothy, what happened to you? I got hurt. Well, now, let's have a look at you. Stand up. Mrs. Carbold, if, if you think I do... We'll put it on a trial basis, but I'm sure you will. Oh. Well, then, as soon as I can make arrangements here, I, I'd love to have the position. New York's so far away, Margaret. Oh, I can come home often over the weekends, Mother. And just think I won't have any living expenses. I can send much more money home. Well... You'll have a fine house now. And all the things you've been wanting. Someday you'll have a fine house too, Mother. Someday when we're all grown up, between us we'll be able to give you everything you've ever wanted. I'm afraid you'll never be able to give me then what I have now. But you don't have anything now. That's the trouble. Margaret, don't be too impressed by wealth and position, dear. They're nice to have. But they aren't everything. We've got position, Mother. Why, your people and Dad's people were from the best families in this part of the country. But, Margaret, you can't get by in this world on the strength of what your grandparents were. You have to rise or fall on the strength of what you are. Oh, Margaret, you... You, you worry me sometimes, so... And I'll be all right, Mother. I hope so, dear. I hope so. <laughs> Mother and all, 
I'm writing to you from my suite at Mrs. Carvel's. I have a large bedroom, a sitting room with a fireplace, and a bath all to myself. Everyone is very nice to me, and I love it here. Oh, incidentally, was it Father's uncle who was a judge in Quincy? I was talking to Mrs. Carvel about it last night. Dear mother and all, the days go so fast here that sometimes it's hard to keep track of them. We're sailing for Europe next week. The children are to be put in school in Switzerland. And Mrs. Carbold and I are going to spend the summer in Italy. Can you imagine? Italy. Italy. Gee, that's a long way from us, isn't it, Mother? Yes, son. Italy's a long ways from us. Dear mother and all, I'm writing to you in an Italian garden. I wish you could see it. Just beyond the garden walls, the cliffs slide down to a blue Italian sea, and now and then you can hear the voices of the, of the fishermen. We've been here a month now, and, and I've met someone. His name is John Tennyson. He's an American professor over here on a lecture tour. He's tall, and he has brown eyes, and a kind of a smile that makes you forget what he's saying. Margaret. Oh, he's coming now. More later. Love, Margaret. letters again. Oh, just a short letter home. Am I interrupting? Oh, of course not. Sit down. Someday I'm going to meet that family of yours. Oh, uh, well, they, uh, they live quite a ways from New York, in a little town called Weston. Weston? Do you know the town? I've been through there a million times. My Aunt Pamela lives about 30 miles away. She raised me, you know. I want her to meet you. She thinks girls like you don't exist anymore. Well, I, I'd love to meet her. The sun's going down. Have you got time now for a walk down to the shore? Oh, plenty of time. Well, come on, then. Margaret! Is something wrong, Mrs. Carbone? It's Victoria. The school just phoned me. She's ill. I want to get her and fly home immediately. Oh, I hope it isn't anything serious. Well, the school says it isn't, but I want to get her home to her own doctor. Will you find out about the planes, Margaret? Oh, yes, of course. I'll go with you. Perhaps I can help. I'm going down to the village to pick up some things I ordered. I won't be long. Well... Well, a dream ends quickly, doesn't it? Someone sticks a pin in it, and there it goes. I'd hoped we were going to be here all summer. So did I. I'm going to miss Italy. I'm going to miss you. But I'll find you as soon as I get back. I'm coming to Weston and meet that family of yours. But I'll be at Bar Harbor with Mrs. Carbo. Then I'll pick you up and drive you to Weston. Why are you so anxious to meet my family, John? Because at last I've met you. James Hilton will return to present the second act of Kathleen Norris's novel, Mother, starring Linda Darnell. In the 17th century, the brilliant philosopher Pascal told of a common experience in this simple but enduring sentence. Kind words produce their own images in men's souls. What was true in Pascal's 17th century is certainly no less true today. We all know how a kind word can affect our mood can lighten sadness, double our gladness, or make a happy occasion happier still. Those who make Hallmark greeting cards appreciate this effective power of words, appreciate it so well that the words in a Hallmark card accurately reflect your own feelings. And the same skill that perfects the choice of words in a Hallmark card perfects it in every detail of design, color, and craftsmanship. 
You'll find this true, for example, in the wide and varied selection of Hallmark cards for Mother's Day this coming Sunday. And if you've put it off so far, you'll want to stop in tomorrow at the friendly store where you buy your Hallmark cards for your Mother's Day remembrance. Now, through the courtesy of RKO Radio Pictures Incorporated, producers of Adventure in Baltimore, starring Robert Young, Shirley Temple, and John Agar, the Hallmark Playhouse brings you the second act of Kathleen Norris's famous novel, Mother, starring Linda Darnell. <laughs> Margaret and Mrs. Carbolt flew home with the children. Victoria recovered almost at once, but it was late August before Margaret managed things so that she could get home for a visit. She didn't tell anyone she was coming, and the front part of the house was empty when she walked in, except for the flies that had come in through the holes in the front screen. She looked around hopelessly. The springs were still broken in the sofa. The piano was still littered with books and magazines. Everything was just the same. She found her mother in the kitchen. Margaret! Oh, my baby! My girl, Margaret! What are you doing here? Why didn't you let us know? Oh, how good it is to see you. Hello, Mother, oh, darling. Why didn't you tell us you were coming? Oh, I wanted to surprise you. Oh, dear. Mother, there's some iron wire in the mailbox. For... This... Margaret! Oh, Margaret, when did you get here? Just a few minutes ago. Oh, you look wonderful. Gee, I'm glad to see you. Here, this wire is for you. Oh, it must be for Mrs. Carbold. I hope she doesn't want you to come right back. No, it's... It's from John. John? Uh, John Tennyson. Remember, I wrote you about him? Oh, yes. He says he's just back in the States, and Mrs. Carbold wrote him that I was here, and, and he wants to drive over tomorrow for the day. Well, that's lovely. I bought a roast of beef. Isn't that fortunate? Oh, I, I don't think I'd better let him come, Mother. I mean, there's so many of us, and there's such confusion on Sundays. I, I'll warn him that some other time might be better. Oh, he's more than welcome, Margaret. Mother, hmm? can't you see? Margaret doesn't want him to come here. Oh. Well, whatever you think is best, Margaret. Maybe it would be more pleasant for him later in the year. In October, perhaps, when the leaves turn. Why, I'll wire him right away. Well, Margaret, did you enjoy the sermon? Oh, very much, Dad. I'm sorry Mother couldn't come, though. Mother always feels she has to fuss with a Sunday dinner. Phew, it's a hot day. Yes, it's another scorcher. Oh, look, Ted and Becker out in the sprinkler in their bathing suits. <laughs> I'd like to join them myself. Margaret, who's that man on the front porch? Oh, there is someone sitting there, isn't there? Oh, no. No, I said I'm a wire. Hey, careful, don't catch your dress on the gate. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, Margaret. We're all wet. Come on in. <laughs> John, how nice to see you. I didn't get any answer to my wire, so I assumed it was all right to come. Oh, Julie, may I present Mr. Tennyson? Hello, Mr. Tennyson. How do you do? Father, Mr. Tennyson. My father, John. How are you, young man? How do you do, sir? Margaret, your mother invited me to lunch. Can I have some more meat, please, Ted? Please. Oh, pass your plate. <laughs> Mrs. Tennyson, would you mind passing Ted's plate? Oh, of course not. No, sir, the old man isn't needed these days. Most of you young fellas are starting out at pretty near the same money I'm getting after 25 years. John isn't in a bank, Father. Well, it applies to any profession. Was that a box of candy you brought? Rebecca. Rebecca, I don't want to have to ask you to leave the table. I was just inquiring. Yes, as a matter of fact, it is a box of candy. Candy? Oh, boy. When are we going to open it? Ted. Oh, I, I'm so sorry, John. They really know better. We don't get much candy. Ted. We don't. Well, you know how it is, Mr. Tennyson. 
to children, sometimes it seems like a, a, a long time between candy. <laughs> I suppose it does. Uh, I'll get the ice cream. Well, that's the idea, Mother. That'll be a nice treat. You know, Mother can make ice cream so much cheaper than you can buy it, and there's no comparison in the flavor. In the summer, we buy cheaper meat, and then we can have ice cream more often. And you appreciate the ice cream when you get it, don't you, son? You bet. Mm. Aren't you going to open the candy? Now, Rebecca, I don't want to hear any more about that candy. Mother... Please excuse me for a moment. I, I've got a headache. Yeah, you better give me your hand. The hill's getting steep. Why don't you say it? You're thinking it. Why don't you say it? Thinking what? If only you hadn't come down here today. If only you'd gotten my wire. I didn't want you to come down here. The dust and, and the heat and the flies and the kids. Well, you wanted to know about my background. Now you know. What are you talking about? I'm talking about you and what you think. Do you want to know what I was thinking? I was thinking that life at Mrs. Carbold's must seem very dull and uninspired after all you've had here in Weston. After all I've had here? A wonderful, mellow old house like that that's been lived in. A warm, friendly family. You can say that after that lunch? I hope your family didn't think I was an awful dope. I hardly opened my mouth, but I was having such fun listening to those kids. Oh, but they, they behaved so badly. Well, you can't expect them to behave instinctively like adults, you know. That only comes with time. And your mother. Margaret, I think your mother is one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. Oh, John. Look. The sun's going down. What does it remind you of? A garden in Italy? Yes. You know, I thought it was because it was Italy that the garden seemed so particularly beautiful. But it's the same way today. I think it's the most beautiful day I've seen in my whole life. All afternoon, I've been trying to make up a speech, but I haven't gotten very far with it. But now the day's almost gone. And all I can do is tell you... Margaret, I love you. Will you marry me? Hello, dear. Mother. I thought you'd be in bed. I saw John to the train, and since then I've just been walking and thinking. It was so nice tonight, I... I thought I'd sit out here for a while. Mother, do you know what John said about you? John said that... that you were one of the most beautiful women he'd ever seen. <clears throat> well, fancy that. You know, Mother, I... I'm afraid I never thought much about it until tonight, but, but he's right. You are beautiful. You don't need beauty parlors or fancy clothes. It, it shines right through you. My dear. My dear. And when I think of all you've given up for us... Margaret, I didn't give up anything for you. Every woman chooses some means of expression, whether it's music or painting or, or business. I found my expression in my children. My own sense of joy and accomplishment has come in watching all of you grow up, in doing what I could to help you find yourselves, in loving you. Oh, Mother, I hope I can be all that to my children. Isn't it funny how you can change overnight? Well, I don't want any of the things now I wanted yesterday. There weren't any roots to the things I wanted yesterday. You're going to marry John? Yes. Yes, in June or July when he completes his lecture tour. And, Mother, I'm not going back to Mrs. Carbold. I want to come back here and take my class again. I want to be close to the family, and I want to be close to you. Oh, my child. 
my child. I want to learn the things you know about living. And I want so much for people to say of me. She is her mother's daughter. Welcome home, my daughter. Welcome home. Before James Hilton and Linda Darnell return, I'd like to remind you that this coming Sunday is Mother's Day, a day on which we should not fail to tell our mothers how much they mean to us. So don't let the day go by without telling your mother what's in your heart and mind, whether she's near or far away. And you'll find your feelings perfectly expressed in a Hallmark card. You might delight her, for example, with the unique new Hallmark card that opens up into a golden crown. It carries these words... Do just exactly as you please. Have everything your way. And here's a crown that you can wear, for you are queen today. There are Hallmark cards that will be just right, whatever you desire. Cards of lovely color and beautiful design, with words of affection and sincerity and heartfelt love. So stop in tomorrow or Saturday at the friendly store where you buy your Hallmark card. You can make your gift to Mother doubly memorable by tucking your Hallmark card inside. You know she will cherish your remembrance. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you, Linda Darnell. One of the rewards of giving a fine performance must be knowing that it has pleased so many people. Tonight, Miss Darnell, you have earned that reward. You've not only pleased us very much, but I know you've pleased millions of others all around the country. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. And thanks to Verna Felton, who so beautifully played Mother. You know, it is rewarding to know that you've pleased an audience. And for the same reasoning, your Hallmark Playhouse must have won a lot of friends, like your Hallmark cards. We certainly hope so, because the Hallmark tradition is founded on friendship. And we think we shall hold to that tradition again next week, when we shall present James Thurber's great baseball story, You Could Look It Up, starring William Frawley. And the following week, Sir Arthur Pinero's The Enchanted Cottage, starring Richard Widmark. And following that, Kenyon Nicholson's play The Barker, starring Charles Bickford. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. And Miss Darnell and Mr. Hilton, may I remind you and all of our listeners that Sunday is Mother's Day. There's a fine selection of appropriate Mother's Day cards for every taste and every budget. Now on display at the Friendly Store, where you buy your Hallmark cards. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you carry enough to send the very best. Linda Darnell appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of It Happens Every Spring. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all and inviting you next Thursday and every Thursday to tune in one half hour earlier and listen to the adventures of Casey, crime photographer, followed by the Hallmark Playhouse. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.